Congratulations, it's a pleasure uh, for me to uh, welcome all of you here. But uh, in the first place, to welcome Professor Simon Balmer, who is the uh, head of the Department of Politics at the University of Sheffield, uh, and author of, of many of those books you have certainly encountered. Also in our library here at the Institute, like the um, uh, European Union Politics and uh, many of the books you certainly are familiar with. Uh, today's lecture, the, the, the title of, of the uh, lecture today is Germany and the Eurozone Crisis between Hegemony and Domestic Politics. Uh, as you know, Professor Baumer has been dealing with this issue for, for uh, even his dissertation thesis, if I'm not mistaken, uh, already dealt with that issue. So, so it's a um, uh, not the eurozone crisis. Not the eurozone crisis <laughs> yet at that time. I'm not that young. So, uh, without mu uh, uh, much ado, I will just pass the floor to Professor Obama, and then, of course, as you know, the usual format of our meetings is that first we'll have a a uh, talk by Professor Obama, and then we'll open the the, the um, open up the discussion for your questions and comments. So, so sorry. Okay, thanks very much, Peter, and uh, thank you for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak about uh, my research, for which I get relatively little time these days as head of department where I'm uh, managing student admissions, my colleagues, and all that kind of uh, stuff. Uh, it isn't as serious, though, as the Eurozone crisis, which is the uh, subject I want to talk about. I I think you should have received a paper that I circulated that had a rather different title, alluding to a, uh, a hit record in the 1970s, which may be of no significance to you. I'm going to uh, give this the subtitle Between Hegemony and Domestic Politics, because what I'm emphasizing in this paper is the contrast between the expectations placed upon Germany as the by now number one clear leader in economic terms in the European Union and the domestic constraints which if anything have increased of late with politicization and so on uh, and which make Germany's capacity to provide a solution to this difficult crisis more difficult. Um, so uh, I'm going to divide this uh, paper into uh, I think six parts, although I notice I've got a part with uh, that there's no number four, so maybe it's five parts. I've obviously renumbered something there at the last minute. Uh, but what I want to first of all um, uh, talk about, making sure that we diagnose the Eurozone crisis correctly, because I think we need to know what it is that has to be resolved in order to know whether Germany can contribute to its resolution. Uh, it's commonly seen, of course, as a sovereign debt crisis, most obviously uh, in the Portuguese and Greek cases. Uh, sorry, I'm forgetting the top technology here. I don't know where do I point this over here? Just anywhere, I think. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So first of all, it's a, it's a sovereign debt crisis with uh, the Greek and uh, Portuguese problems. Uh, before that, of course, the general financial, global financial crisis. But we also uh, have a banking crisis, uh, which was manifested most with the Irish case, and also uh, with Spain, where property bubbles led to uh, excessive private sector spending that the state has had to intervene in and in the Spanish situation there was no sovereign debt crisis until it intervened in the, uh, in the banking crisis. Uh, there is of course in the longer term the need to create economic growth because if all the cuts in public expenditure associated with austerity follow on uh, indefinitely. Uh, we'll never generate enough economic activity to uh, make it a virtual, virtuous circle rather than the vicious cycle 
that it is uh, at the moment. I think there's a, uh, a fourth crisis, which is a leadership crisis, a political leadership crisis in the European Union. Who is it exactly? You know, we used to have a question in, in my younger days was about European foreign policy, the so-called Henry Kissinger question. Who is it that I get on the phone to to find out what the European Union is doing? Now, here we have uh, a different kind of crisis. Who is it in the European Union who is solving the Eurozone crisis? Is it uh, the chair of the Euros group? Is it the president of the European Council, the president of the Commission? Is it Angela Merkel? Uh, I think the kind of concerns that British Eurosceptics had uh, way back in the early 90s at the, times of the, Ma the time of the Maastricht Treaty about you can't have monetary union without political union have manifested themselves in a different kind of way in the sense that nobody seems to be taking charge of finding the solution. Nobody is there who can get ahead of the financial markets. Uh, so there's a political leadership crisis. Probably in Southern Europe in particular, there's a legitimacy crisis. Who is it that's agreed to imposing these conditions upon us? Uh, and finally, we haven't got enough crises already, just wanting to make everybody look uh, really happy on a Tuesday afternoon. There's a kind of architectural crisis. Do we find the solutions uh, to the problems in the Eurozone uh, or in the European Union? And of course, if it's in the European Union, then Britain becomes a bit of a problem, perhaps not only Britain, since we're here in Prague. Um, uh, and the fiscal compact, I guess, is, is part of that story. So is the Eurozone becoming the hard core of European uh, integration? Right, um, so the first point I really want to make in this uh, talk is to highlight that Germany has assumed absolute centrality in the Eurozone crisis. But this has created an, a set of dilemmas, two of which, the first and second, I'm going to focus on in particular, but the third and fourth remain for resolution, but let's deal with them at a time, maybe we can address those in the questions. How has Germany been confirmed as number one? By which, of course, I'm referring to the fact that the traditional Franco-German motor uh, does not seem to be the way forward. It does not seem to be the way forward because there's difficulty in getting agreement between the two states, uh, being unilateral actions by Germany on the so-called haircut by bondholders, and I think particularly since the election of President Hollande, uh, that the consensus between the two states is much more uh, problematic. Uh, so it appears that the Franco-German relationship has weakened and at the moment does not appear to be the uh, basis for uh, finding solutions. Of course, the German economy, um, which unlike France, uh, which lost its AAA rating, continues apace with economic growth, prodigious export, prodigious uh, export performance and a uh, GDP to debt ratio that is below the sort of 60 percent reference rate. Uh, on those kinds of indicators Germany is in a uh, strong position and it's also if you like going to be the paymaster of any of the bailout mechanisms uh, from this position of strength and has an important role in consequence in setting the conditions that have to be adhered to and which often find inspiration in the design of the German political economy. Uh, however, uh, uh, well, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here, and in addition to that, um, there are other, the other member states, because of their economic weakness, uh, they have limited leadership capacity. 
Now, not to say, not saying by that that Germany has got fantastic leadership capacity. That's going to be dilemma number two. But first of all, let's deal with dilemma number one. Dilemma number one is that there is, not for the first time as a Financial Times journalist, Martin Wolf uh, put it, a conflict between two principles of the German state post-war, sound money and European integration. I think that's a, a longer story, as I will say, I think, in speaking to the next uh, slide. But it certainly is in a heightened form this time uh, because of the critical nature of the problem. So finding a way in which Germany can offer solutions to the Eurozone crisis that are consistent with its sound money approach and at the same time wrap them up in more European integration is a very difficult uh, act to put into practice. And it's a particularly difficult put, uh, act to put into practice due to the second dilemma of the German position, which is that it has uh, a position of economic hegemony in the European Union, or the Eurozone in particular, but that is unmatched by either aspirations to or conditions to pursue political hegemony or political leadership, for reasons I'll look at in the slide after next. So this raises a number of further dilemmas, should it depart from the tradition for the last 40 years at least of German-European policy of doing everything jointly with France and go solo, which of course raises sort of historical concerns, the Alain gang of the past, or should it try to work harder at finding a compromise with France, which might of course compromise its sound money principles. And the final dilemma is uh, trying in this world of swift events and unforeseen consequences not to delay so much that it might risk the Eurozone's breakup and its ability to press for further European integration which might take the whole enterprise forward as part of a broader solution to the Eurozone wrapped up in further steps, or steps to further political integration. So let's look at the first dilemma, the one between sound money and European integration. Now, look at this first of all, uh, well, look at it principally around about history, but coming up to the relative present, and then we'll look at the tension between economic hegemony and political leadership. The origins of sound money are in the post-war model of West German capitalism, later uh, the model of the unified Germany, with its inspiration in ordo-liberalism, the Freiburg School, uh, which essentially is based around three principles, monetary stability and combating Inflation, which is at the heart of the mission of the European Central Bank, found its inspiration there from the German Bundesbank. Uh, its fiscal conservatism. Germany may be concerned about its own fiscal debt. Um, of course, it's not a problem when compared with other European states, but it's, there has been a pattern of uh, fiscal conservatism. Uh, by contrast with other states like France and in earlier times Britain which embraced Keynesianism and willingness to inflate uh, or to pump prime the economy when it was in difficulty to uh, fuel growth. And the third principle is that of international competitiveness which of course is the basis of Germany as what Wolfgang Hager called an extraordinary trader. Now, maybe 
uh, to just look in the next uh, bullets at uh, some of the examples where there have been tension between sound money and European integration. The first case, and I've just finished my coffee, wasn't really quite about sound money and European integration, but it was between auto liberal principles and European integration, and, and it was the tension in the 1950s by, between Chancellor Adenauer, who was committed to political integration on a Franco-German basis, and the uh, finance minister, economics and finance minister Ludwig Erhard, who was the architect of the German economic miracle, and who was less interested in political integration and more in European integration as an arena of economic cooperation and trade. Uh, this led to turf wars and it led to one of those things that I was fascinated by when I was doing my thesis back in the late 1970s uh, about how Germany is distinctive in having two ministries coordinating European policy. At that stage the Foreign Office uh, and the Economics Ministry. This owes its uh, origins to the stalemate between Adenauer uh, and Erhard. But we find this tension re-emerging and delicate balances being drawn in later periods in the first effort uh, to economic and monetary union in the 1970s. There was this conflict between the economics and the monetarists, the economists, who were those who wanted economic union first, the monetarists who wanted to have a single currency or monetary union, perhaps more accurately in those days, and that would then pull the economies towards convergence with Germany. Uh, on the economist side, uh, I don't think there were advocates in Germany at all of the monetary position of going first for monetary union, but nevertheless there were those who saw integration policy <coughs> as a priority, and the balancing act within the EMU negotiations was the idea of parallelism in the Werner report of that, uh, that period. Similar kinds of things happen in the European monetary system where uh, Chancellor Schmidt, uh, this is back in the late 70s, was keen to stabilize currency regimes, the Foreign Office was keen on really re-enlivening European integration. This was the doldrums era, but the German Bundesbank was less keen on any of these arrangements if they should risk the <coughs> monetary stability tradition uh, in Germany. So there was complicated negotiations within Germany as much as with uh, other partners at that time about, about the design of the European monetary system, which again reflected sound money and European integration compromising. Now with EMU, uh, which, uh, the design of which is by Germany, uh, if you like, to put it crudely, but with, with Helmut Kohl's leadership in the sense of pushing for further integration to bind the reunified Germany into the European political system, we find this again, the design uh, is essentially about the convergence criteria, debt ratios, public spending limits, and so on, that are written into the Maastricht Treaty as the entry requirement, later backed up with the Stability and Growth Pact in uh, 96, led by uh, Theo Weigel, the then CSU uh, Finance Minister. On the pure monetary side, the Bundesbank was very influential in shaping the statute of the European Central Bank. So Germany was reassured about its sound monetary, money policy by having its sound money policy translated to the European level, but with a political overlay from Helmut Kohl that this was all part of designing a deeper European Union, as it then became. A European Union with a political union counterpart on foreign security policy, justice, and home affairs. So it's somewhat ironic, then, of course, that when it comes to uh, the mid 2000s, uh, we have Germany, 
along with France, as one of the states that actually breached the rules that Germany had instilled into the design of EMU. Uh, and uh, unlike Portugal and Ireland that have been censured, censored under the uh, excessive deficit procedure, for France and Germany it seemed to be all right to break the rules. And of course, that leaves, we don't hear much about that now. Um, it would be a bit inconvenient for the German government to uh, publicize this. But, uh, and of course it would argue that there were special reasons for this. The costs of German unification in particular uh, were high and uh, Schroeder blamed spending commitments by the German lender and the previous government and so on, but actually tried to, this is interesting, it was at a time when he was emphasizing that it was possible to speak about national interests for the first time in German European policy before the European interest was the national interest. And uh, he was quite willing to defend interests and this entailed breaching the stability and growth plan. Of course, public support for these sound money principles is quite high, and we can find that in the, uh, at the time, its opposition to giving up the Deutschmark, or reluctance to give up the Deutschmark in the opinion polls. So if we move on a bit more to the um, uh, European integration side of the equation, trying to balance this balance out this dilemma, the pro-integration discourse has been prominent throughout the whole history of, uh, since the Schumann plan, because this is a way of building German credibility and reliability after the war, after the Nazi uh, era, uh, an advocacy of federalism, sort of desires the principles of design for European Union. Germany was a big advocate of successive initiatives for integration because this was a good way of uh, projecting German interests in a European coat or clothing, if you like, and made it easier in areas like foreign policy to negotiate in certain areas of the world, like the Middle East, for instance, the legacy uh, of the Holocaust, uh, to do that in a European community framework uh, was more acceptable than to do it as a, a national uh, policy. And the Franco-German uh, relationship, or motor, uh, was the vehicle for most of these integrationist uh, initiatives, whether the European monetary system, the ideas behind the Maastricht Treaty, and so on. In all of this, Germany was very strong on its tactics, uh, sorry, on its strategy, because it was able to rely on cross-party support. All parties have come in for support for integration. Uh, free Democrats in the 60s, the Social Democrats in the late 50s. So there was assurance, it was not the divisions over the desirability of integration that we have in UK in particular, as you have in the Czech Republic as well, there was uh, a strong foundation for setting a pro-European strategy, but it was sometimes less good on tactics because of the, what we might call the polyphonic approach to um, running European integration policy in Germany, two coordinating ministries, the lender, which had their own views at times on European integration so, and coalition politics, of course, which bring their own tensions. So Germany sometimes was a bit incoherent on day-to-day -day policy, but was generally good on the vision, on the uh, what Helmut Kohl called the Schicksalsgemeinschaft, the, the community of destiny uh, of uh, European Union. Um, and these other actors, the parliament, the lender, sectional interests were generally uh, as part of pro-European consensus. That changes from reunification, 
particularly after Helmut Kohl stepping down, and from Chancellor Schroeder's uh, period as, uh, at the helm onwards. So that's the history of this. Now what I'm going to do is turn to the next dilemma, and I will continue the sound money and European integration, I hope, as I, as I do that. And I'm going to uh, now look at the dilemma between Germany's position as an economic hegemon, uh, data on that in the paper, um, and the domestic constraints of internal politics and also the role of the Federal Constitutional Court increasingly uh, that restrict the ability for Germany to live up to that. Uh, I mean, it's a new version of the sort of economic giant political pygmy view that's been long, uh, long held. I don't think it's a political pygmy, incidentally. That's uh, going. I think we've passed that uh, that time now. Now, um, hegemony is, uh, it says up here, is has got two characteristics: domination and leadership. Now, I don't think we're dealing with domination here because clearly uh, the European Union is designed to avoid domination. So I don't think that's an option. But it's worth bearing in mind that it's one definition of hegemony. Another is is leadership. Uh, you might ask whether economically Germany is uh, dominant, but politically uh, it clearly isn't. Now, in the academic literature, uh, I think in the 1980s, from the 1980s onwards, uh, this idea of hegemonic stability theory uh, arose in the USA, which was built around the idea of the United States as leading the Western world through a set of financial and political institutions, the uh, Bretton Woods system, the uh, NATO, uh, and so on. And it's associated with benevolent self-interest, providing public goods and the use of soft power, uh, not just guns and military hardware. Uh, that is a theory that it would be an interesting one to apply to Germany's role uh, in the European Union. Does it amount to, or the Eurozone, does Germany amount to the sort of guarantor of the collective system? Well, I think it can only be the guarantor if it exercises leadership, but also brings the followers with it, because the Western political system and US leadership in it was not just about American leadership, it was also everybody else being content to go along with that. And we can see in the Eurozone crisis that in Southern Europe, German leadership is contentious, at least on the streets of Madrid and, and Athens. So uh, if hegemony requires followership, then there are clearly some issues there. If you go back to really early in literature on hegemony, uh, like the Greek city-states, then the literature there focuses on the need to have domestic consent for playing that role. And I think that's quite important for understanding current day dilemmas, because as I'll argue uh, shortly, uh, German support for European integration has now become more critical than at any time in the post-war period, and that's making it more difficult, making Chancellor Merkel more attentive to public opinion and politics, and she's got an election she wants to win uh, next year. And that, of course, places restrictions on the ability uh, to lead. If we take a kind of Gramscian approach to hegemony, sort of international political economy, it's it's about creating a, a hegemonic discourse, usually seen as a class-based discourse, but we maybe can dispense with the class here. And I think, in a way, there is a, a kind of hegemonic discourse, whether it has the followership behind it is another matter, and that is a hegemonic discourse around austerity, which derives from the sound money principles to which Germany naturally refers back when it's trying to tackle uh, the European uh, Eurozone crisis. 
Then there are a set of, of indicators of German hegemony that are spelt out in the paper, the, its continued economic growth, its relatively strong fiscal or financial uh, position, the increased labor competitiveness that it, that it obtained under the Hartz reforms that were introduced by Gerhard Schröder's uh, coalition, which meant that the single currency has subsequently been a real benefit to the German export industry. Um, and, of course, it's the Weltmeister, the world champion of exporting. Its attention is shifting to markets like everybody else, but it's probably at the front, forefront of it, to China, to India, uh, where there's untapped demand for BMWs and Mercedes uh, uh, and so on. So all these things indicate that Germany has a uh, uh, considerable foundation to uh, economic hegemony. Uh, but can it offer this uh, stability through political leadership? And here I think we find Germany to be a reluctant hegemon, as a term that my sometime co-author Willie Patterson uh, used. Uh, it is really constrained by a number of uh, changing circumstances in the post-reunification period. So I pick up now with the post-reunification period, uh, and this is how the sound money uh, European integration dilemma merges, if you like, with the hegemony versus domestic politics dilemma. Now, of course, reunification removes some of the external constraints on German governments, the settlement of the Berlin problem, uh, troops withdrawing from uh, their stations, American troops, British troops in, in Germany. But this did not mean removing the sort of shackles that were part of German semi-sovereignty in the post-war period. Because my argument here is that some internal ones, and many of those internal ones were designed by the uh, Allied powers, including Britain, uh, these internal ones have become more prominent. Not because of allied intervention, obviously, because politics has been liberated and new factors have come into play. And new factors like generational change. The wartime generation really came to an end, crudely put, with the uh, election of Gerhard Schroeder in 1998. So the kind of cultural commitment an identity of commitment to European identity, European integration, has declined as uh, the generations have changed, and we have then a situation of less love for Europe uh, at elite level, uh, exacerbated intermittently by coalition politics, for instance, the tensions, uh, if we look at the Eurozone, uh, crisis, both the CSU and the Free Democrats have been critical about aspects of a solution. The Free Democrats are opposed to a transfer union. The CSU in Bavaria are um, also opponents of that. And uh, when I was in Bavaria uh, in September, uh, Angela Merkel was lobbying for more solidarity from the CSU for the Euro, Eurozone problems because of the need to find a, a solution. So I think this is all part of the way in which Europe has become less of a matter of hearts than it was originally and more about, more in the character of British European policy of making rational calculations about interests and sound money is one of those interests. Uh, there's an increased salience of and attentiveness to public opinion. I think this is particularly clear uh, under 
the government's led by Angela Merkel because it's not her instinct to lead from the front, but to weigh up the options, to pay attention to public opinion, and only at a relatively late stage make a decisive intervention when she's uh, sorted matters out. We saw this, for instance, uh, when was that? In May 2010, I think, the North Rhine-Westphalian election, when uh, decisions were delayed, uh, and she failed to secure a governing majority in North Rhine-Westphalia anyhow, so you end up with the kind of worst of uh, both options. And there has also been uh, signs of growing party politicisation, not just in the coalition that I've mentioned uh, a moment ago, uh, but there have been occasions where there have been divisions in the Bundestag on votes relating to uh, the Eurozone. Uh, of course, it remains in the hands of Die Linke, the successors to the East German Communist Party for the outright opposition to European uh, integration. But dissenting voices have become uh, more prominent, and I, there's some data here on votes at times in the paper on Eurozone solutions. Further, there's the fairly sensational debate in the uh, red top press about pension entitlements to uh, in Greece uh, or uh, Mario Draghi's interventions uh, in the debt markets as writing a blank check uh, implying this is German money and so on so this has created um, an atmosphere uh, that's ripe for uh, more critical views in the, amongst the political elite. But particularly important here is the role of the Federal Constitutional Court. Um, its intervention really came firstly with the Maastricht Treaty ruling, uh, where it made stipulations um, that, for instance, when the step is taken towards a single currency, there has to be an explicit vote in the Bundestag. And we've seen this repeated. For those of you who are historical institutionalists, the Federal Constitutional Court goes back to this principle. It, it appears every time there is a challenge about the compatibility of some new stage of integration with the German Constitution, so with the Lisbon Treaty, the idea that uh, you, some areas of competence could be transferred to the EU without a new uh, treaty. So again, there has to be an explicit vote in Parliament to make that step. This is all consistent with the view that the member states, the member governments are the so-called masters of the treaty. The Herren der Verträge, a very intergovernmental view, rather different from the tone over the longer term of German governments and political parties, which are more supranationalist. Uh, so not only is there this critical tone introduced into the political debate, making uh, the government more cautious for fear of challenges before the, the court, and there were challenges over the uh, financial stability facility and the European stability mechanism, a ruling, the last ruling in uh, September, which said it was legal, but every time you increase its size, you've got to have an explicit vote in the Bundestag or in the Parliament. Now, each time you open up uh, an arena for potential party political contestation, so with the political atmospherics, coalition tensions, at some stage in the future, the risk is there that actually we almost move into British or, dare I say, Czech circumstances where you've created an arena for those kinds of divisions and, and maybe an emergent Euroscepticism uh, in Germany. And I mentioned also Germany's own fiscal problems, its increase in the public debt over the years, 
till it breached the Stability and Growth Pact, and which led it to the uh, sort of emergency break, the, the threshold above which now in the Constitution it may not go in its debt level, and which it's advocated and had written into the Fiscal Compact for all member states of the Eurozone as a solution to their problems. It won't, of course, help those states where there was a banking uh, crisis. That's why we need uh, a solution with the uh, European uh, Banking Union that's uh, under negotiation. So, as a result of this, policy has been cautious. It's led to criticism for slowness, that the costs of bailing out Greece increased because of indecisiveness. But the indecisiveness is part of making sure domestic public opinion doesn't think you've sold out too early. So trying to face both directions in the maelstrom of the financial markets is, is a difficult um, uh, position. And the solution has been to impose uh, sound money for recipients of the bailout money, uh, and I refer again to Germany's balanced budget uh, rule. And this, of course, has been seen as economic hegemony in southern Europe of, uh, perhaps even political hegemony, of uh, imposing upon uh, those states uh, solutions which are unpalatable, that are causing misery, and at the same time, over the longer term, may actually uh, create a, a vicious cycle from which there is no clear exit. So, to conclude, uh, Germany has developed a, uh, a really successful model of political economy in the uh, post-war period. That's how we've got to economic hegemony, but its in domestic institutional <coughs> structure is not conducive to swift decisions, to leadership. It's reliant on building consensus and under Merkel to paying attention to public opinion, particularly with the run-up to next year's election. We may expect more dramatic action perhaps after that election, if assuming she's re-elected. Uh, economic he hegemony, in other words, has to uh, coexist with uh, the constraints of domestic politics at home and internationally with the issue of its acceptability in southern Europe. And this is where, in particular, any notion of France moving towards a pro-growth approach or as the leader of southern Europe would be a real difficulty in find, present real difficulties in finding a solution to this uh, Eurozone crisis. So, weighing up sound money in European integration, weighing up hegemony and domestic politics is possibly an option or feasible, but it then does lead to two further dilemmas where we get into a bit more of a uh, speculative mode here, and that is whether the moves that are currently underway uh, being thought about for further integration, whether those moves can enable a new step in European integration, most likely confined to Eurozone countries, while also tackling the Eurozone crisis. So, almost going back to the earlier period of uh, German-European policy where integrationist steps hid German interests, if you like, because they were dressed up in a pro-European rhetoric. Can we get back to that? There's not really been anybody speaking in pro-European rhetoric since uh, Joschka Fischer in 2000 uh, with his Humboldt speech that uh, launched in a way the convention uh, on the future of Europe. And can Germany really find a way of 
an accommodation with France, which has been the key way in securing advances in resolving dilemma number three. So, um, Germany in the Eurozone crisis, between hegemony and domestic politics, we have uh, the sort of uh, writ large, the Chinese proverb, we live in interesting times. Thankfully, I'm not in the Chancellery in Berlin trying to grapple with all these issues, which of course is a big contrast with David Cameron, who sits in London trying to ignore all these things or blame them for the failure of the British economy to grow and tackle all its domestic, uh, uh, its own domestic financial problems. And for the answers, I think we have to wait to 2014 when that next federal election is behind us and a bit more political spielraum, so room for manoeuvre, uh, is available. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. You, you've, um, thank you for the very comprehensive overview of the, of the German role in, in the EU and, and in, the, in contributing to, to the solution of the Eurozone crisis. Um, of course, you've uh, tackled a number of very <coughs> interesting, perhaps contentious issues as well. Uh, I will use my right as, as the chair and ask some questions myself, and then of course I'll uh, encourage you to, to pose, pose your own um, questions and comments. So my, my two questions are, first, you've met, you said that what we face now is uh, the Eurozone crisis also includes a crisis, crisis of vision, crisis of leadership. Now, my question would be, how do you assess the uh, German vision of the EU? Is there something like that? Because there are many today who argue, yes, there was a time on the Adenauer call and others who had a very clear cut vision of, of the integration process that has been lost in, in Germany. Now, is that true? Do you agree with this assessment? Because there are others who would say no, Merkel, uh, Angela Merkel also has a very clear vision of the EU, and that's what she presented when talking about, about the political union. Now, um, of course, the, the German politics today is much more fragmented. You mentioned that we have a very important role of German constitutional court, which probably would strongly disagree with that vision Angela Merkel presented. So my question would be, uh, do you agree with it that Germany does not have any uh, vision of the integration process anymore? And the second thing, um, and I'm coming back, uh, back to, your, uh, to your last uh, uh, slide and the question you posed there, I would like to hear the answer there because you say, you say sound money versus the integration process. That's that's a long-term problem. In the past, it was not so, so visible because, of course, the integration was not that deep. So there was not such a clear overlap between, between this and that uh, pillar of German uh, European policy. Now, um, uh, where can you find a solution to that? What could make these two uh, principles compatible for Germany? And one answer, Germany now tries to uh, offer or perhaps enforce is is uh, exporting the domestic experience with what we might call austerity, what, what generally sunk money principles abroad. And you mentioned some of these that there is this uh, rule of no budget deficit in Germany, and, and now the attempts to apply the same rule to uh, to the eurozone at large. And my question is: Do you think? that might work, because of course one might argue that if Germany really is a hegemon in the Eurozone, that it should be uh, capable of introducing such a provision uh, in the whole Eurozone. Um, I'm not sure about that, so that's why I'm asking about that. Um, perhaps I would directly ask someone else if anyone want to also pose some questions or will we wait for the second round? Anyone now? 
Yeah, okay. So in that case, I will go. Was it that bad? <laughs> <laughs> it was that comprehensive and exhaustive, I'm sure. Uh, okay, um, is there a vision? Well, I think the, uh, the difficulty there was that with the negotiation, and it shouldn't be forgotten that uh, Chancellor Merkel was fairly decisive in offering leadership in rescuing the Lisbon Treaty after the two year, well, following the Constitutional Treaty uh, rejection. Uh, but once the Lisbon Treaty had been rescued and put into place, there wasn't really a vision. Uh, that was neglected. It appeared that Germany had achieved its goals. And I think that, I'm not quite sure how that came about, why that came about, whether that was exhaustion of uh, what was desired, whether it was this generational change that, that uh, people stop thinking about these uh, issues. But the idea of political union, of relaunching that debate, seemed to me to be rather an afterthought. I think it was last uh, autumn at the CDU party conference. So it looks like there's been a, a sort of long period of thinking, what do we do? And oh yeah, political union, let's try a bit more of that. And it, it's, it seemed, it struck me as being a bit of an afterthought. That's not to say that it isn't now being taken seriously. And it's interesting that the, uh, the SPD, in a way, with this um, uh, commission that it set up, has come up with some, uh, some ideas. So I think there is a, a debate, there is a kind of feeling uh, in the political elite that the attentiveness to the red top press went too far and we've got to have some kind of road map to the future but the, the difficulty then is how you make that acceptable in the European Union because of course the Eurozone crisis is a sort of imminent one and the space for a debate about constitutional options is, is not perceived as being there, uh, which is the forum in which you conduct it. Uh, do you conduct it just for Eurozone states? It seems the most likely successful way, given that uh, David Cameron is one obstacle uh, to doing it at the uh, wider, in a wider EU framework. The constitutional court's position, as you mentioned, uh, in a sense is a rival vision, a vision based on intergovernmentalism. And so there's, there's not only a kind of set of norms <coughs> and values coming from the Constitutional Court, but also the risk that it might become involved in adjudicating whether the, that next step, whatever it is, is compatible with the German basic law. So I think, there's a, I think there's an emergent vision, but these are not the most conducive circumstances in which to have a vision, frankly, because there are pressing uh, things on the agenda. Um, sound money versus integration, what is the solution? Well, uh, I think that there are two answers to that, one of which is what you're asking, what you said yourself about exporting the principles of sound money to the European level, that balances the two out. Uh, and the other component to it would be if this vision for a further step with, towards political union were, I suppose, like political union and monetary union in, in the Maastricht formulation, were parallel steps so that there were, you've got to create a payoff where it's not the Eurozone winners and losers, but there's some other um, terms of trade that satisfy states through other means. It is exceptionally difficult to achieve that where we have a a period where domestic politics in individual member states is at odds with domestic politics in other member states. 
that is a highly problematic context for this. But that would be the, yeah. the, the way of reconciling things. Thank you. So, uh, any comments, any questions from anyone? Yes, please. please. Always identify yourself. Thank you very much. I am Nyung Phan from uh, uh, Metropolitan University, and I'm doing master on international relations in European studies. So I have uh, just one uh, small questions for Dr. Simon Phan. Um, I uh, because you in your presentation you say that German Germany did reach the uh, stability and growth pact. So uh, can you explain in more detail what did Germany do which led to the reaching of uh, the, the uh, stability and growth pact? Uh, and, what? And, and did they and be, uh, did they aware that were they aware that if they did reach the, the rule, it would lead to the, the Eurozone crisis today? <laughs> <laughs> uh, from recollection, it broke the 3% uh, maximum public uh, annual public deficit uh, rule because of the costs of German unification uh, in particular, uh, but I mean that was a difficult scenario to deal with. What did you do? Say, sorry, you've got to stop this public expenditure on the new lender. Would have not been very sensible. And at that time, and France was also in breach, uh, at that time there was a general feeling that the pact was a bit of a bit silly. You know, there's a quote in the paper from uh, Proby, the president of the commission, saying that the rules are not very sensible. So it's interesting how opinion changes over time. So basically the excessive deficit policy um, was simply not applied. Now, I don't think that um, led to the Eurozone crisis. I think it's a separate, uh, a separate issue, but it means that Germany can't occupy the complete moral high ground uh, without forgetting a part of history when it was also in a, uh, a position of breaching those rules. And of course in 2005, I think it was, the Stability and Growth Pact was redefined in a rather looser manner, so it wasn't actually quite as rigid as it was before. So, you know, I, I don't think you can draw too many conclusions from Germany breaching the Stability and Growth Pact uh, because, you know, starting with the Greek sovereign debt crisis and the special circumstances of having had official statistics manipulated, these were very special circumstances that had nothing to do with uh, what happened with the uh, Stability and Growth Pact back in the early 2000s. Um, so, it did breach them. That was the reason. It does not occupy the moral high ground, but there's no causal link with the Eurozone crisis in my view. Perhaps uh, relates to another question I wanted to ask, and that's the proposal by the Finance Minister Schäuble uh, about the currency commissioner, who would have, of course, with the support of, of Merkel, uh, who would have the right to. Uh, control the budgets, basically national budgets, and, and even sort of return them back to the national governments of those who, who, who break the rules now. And of course, the, this should be a replacement of the old uh, uh, problem. So do you think that might be applicable? Or is it something that's absolutely even, I'm not, not, I'm not talking about the Euro European Union as a whole, I'm talking about the Eurozone, but is such an idea uh, conceivable, right, or is it absolutely unacceptable for some Eurozone countries? I, I think it's, um, I think it's more acceptable mm -hmm. than a situation where Germany might be seen as monitoring the budgets of the other Eurozone mm -hmm. 
States. I remember there was some rumours in the press that in Berlin people were going through the Irish budget. Uh, now the idea that Germany rejects the Irish budget, you know, they're also we've talked about a democratic deficit in the European Union, but I mean this really would be political hegemony. Uh, so in a way this is exporting sound money to uh, a commissioner in Brussels, but it has really big implications for national sovereignty and I don't think the debate has gone far enough to see whether people are prepared to accept that. Although I suspect some sort of rules like that have got to be, some tougher uh, measures have got to be found, otherwise we could be back to a sort of modern day equivalent to breaching the stability and growth bank. So, uh, what, what do you think about uh, about the uh, role in 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 this um, euro crisis? And uh, 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 is it possible to say that uh, let's say the, her vision of the European Union uh, as uh, to be to be a political union uh, it's it's workable? Thank you. Okay, let's uh, work in reverse order. Uh, Merkel's uh, position. I mean, I mentioned about how she likes to take a measured approach. In some ways, I sort of thought of her as a better chancellor of the grand coalition, where she had more diversity of opinion to weigh up before. Uh, intervening than perhaps in the early period of the uh, Eurozone uh, crisis. I mean, she has tried to take this measured view to appear as Mutti, as they call her in German, the sort of mother of the German e electorate, if you like, to carry the electorate along with her, which obviously is important for the re-election prospects. Uh, of course, there's a lot to play out in terms of the electoral cycle. There's the question about whether the free Democrats are going to get over the 5% hurdle, uh, because if not, you know, I suppose uh, an alliance with the Greens becomes uh, a possible scenario, which really changes things a little bit. Uh, Joschka Fischer, maybe his hour has come again uh, to present pro-European uh, views. Is her vision of political union workable? I, well, I think firstly it's workable if she gets re-elected. If she's got support from her coalition partners and a, a kind of unity, the test there would be, is the CSU in Bavaria happy to agree to it? And then, is it acceptable to either the other member states of the Eurozone or more widely of, of the Europe, EU? Now, there's a lot of questions there. Um, you're asking me to speculate. Um, I think that's, there's almost too much speculation that goes beyond my comfort zone there. Uh, I think there's a possibility um, of it working. Uh, in one of, I suppose, as one of the scenarios, and that maybe allows me to link to the question from the person behind you. One of those scenarios would precisely be putting together an arrangement that satisfied France as well. Uh, and if it were to satisfy France, then it would certainly have to have the word growth in there, a bit like the Stability and Growth Pact acquired the word growth at a after the election of Jospin in France. Uh, but there are options for doing that. I mean, we've forgotten, I think, about the Europe 2020 initiative. Uh, remember, there was the Lisbon strategy for the Euro European Union to be the most competitive zone in the world economy in 2010. Whatever happened to that, folks? Uh, now it's 2020, but maybe some measures to make that more concrete within whatever the budget settlement has been meantime, 
might be a way to get Hollande on board as part of a package where it's not just about the Eurozone, but it's about wider political vision, growth, and so on. And in order to get to there, we've got to avoid crises probably for the next two years. Merkel re-elected, things go quiet, the financial markets find somewhere else to get interested in, Britain maybe, um, I hope not, but uh, you know, somewhere else where th there's a crisis, maybe a fiscal cliff in the United States, uh, and the circumstances then enable a, a more longer term debate that's looking at the future rather than constant firefighting, who's next to need a bailout, uh, and so on. I mean, so I think that's the positive scenario that links your uh, two questions. Of course, there are other scenarios that the politicians can't keep up with the financial markets and Greece has to leave. That, you know, the conditionality cannot be met by Greece, and it's decided that, you know, um, that's just a step too far. Greece has got to exit the Eurozone, even if there's mayhem in the marketplace and people are getting in boats and taking their Euros with them, <laughs> sailing out from Greece or, or whatever we, we might expect, or going, taking them to London and buying property uh, as they have been uh, as a sort of hedge against the future uh, of the Eurozone. So you've asked for scenarios, that's the two, e two extremes probably, and in between there's the uh, expression that's constantly referred to of kicking the can down the road, you know, just putting, just sort of taking incremental steps and just trying to muddle through in the long uh, manner of policy making. So I think those would be the uh, three scenarios. I'm not sure what to say about Germany's role uh, in the European Commission and European Parliament. I mean, it's, it's, it's significant and it's important that if uh, a vision of political union does emerge, we're still able to discuss that in 2014 that those channels are used as well, both by Germany and potentially by France, in order to take things into a solution in the new European Parliament by the new European Commission. Thank you, thank you. We still have four more minutes to go, so the last chance to ask questions or comments. Yes. yes. Uh, I'm Daniel Kni, I'm from the University of Economics, I'm a PhD student and I study political science. And my question is, uh, concerns the uh, uh, Eurobonds question, so uh, what do you think about this uh, like proposal? Because there is some proposal of uh, uh, some green paper of European Commission uh, which uh, uh, works with different alternatives and uh, so uh, uh, do you think this can help? Uh, then, uh, like Germany is not very in favor of uh, creating some uh, common bonds, so uh, there's the question about the political architecture of the European Union, because uh, they want uh, uh, this political architecture to somehow overarch this uh, project of Eurobonds. Uh, and uh, my question is, uh, there's still a lot of uh, words about the political union, but uh, there's, there are no like, special uh, uh, proposals what it should be or what it should mean. So uh, uh, what do you think it's crucial for Germany to have in the political union? Is it the more participatory uh, like, uh, approach of the European citizens to the European Union? So should there be some referenda or uh, uh, what's, what's, what's the solution of the political uh, uh, union? Or should, should it be the second chamber of the, uh, of the European Parliament? Or uh, what is this debate about, about political union? Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, good questions. I'm not sure I know the answers uh, to that. Of course, uh, in uh, I haven't had the opportunity to go to Berlin recently, to, so I'm following this debate on the internet like you probably are. Um, and uh, there are limitations uh, to that for getting a feel of uh, for getting a feel of uh, things. That's one of the disadvantages of being head of department. I have to spend a lot of time at my desk in Sheffield and. Uh, don't get around, don't get out much. This is a welcome opportunity to come to Prague and see the real world beyond um, academic management. Uh, the Eurobonds question, can this help? Uh, I think this can only help providing it can meet the federal constitutional court test. If and there's been a lot of opposition to euro bonds in, in Germany, questioning whether it's compatible with the no bailout approach. Uh, and the solution of um, uh, market interventions by the European Central Bank seems quite a pragmatic way to achieve similar goals, but without explicitly having uh, euro bonds. And I think that's going to be. Uh, a difficult step to make towards the Eurobonds to, to get uh, a specific arrangement that would be acceptable uh, in the German context unless politicians really take the lead and put the European, uh, put the German Federal Constitutional Court on the spot and say, you know, this is us, we decide these matters. It's not down to lawyers. We're in a particularly uh, but, you know, the Federal Constitutional Court, like previously the German Bundesbank, we've seen in this whole ex exercise the return of the German Bundesbank as a key figure, even though it doesn't, there's no day mark anymore and no German mark. One of those key institutions of post-war German history that commands a lot of public respect. So to actually overrule it and to overrule the Bundesbank even in its sort of remaining role that it has now, carries risks with public opinion. Uh, so I, I think that's going to be uh, a last resort where it would then really put the judges on the spot and say, you know, so the judges are effectively putting <laughs> the uh, Eurozone in, in jeopardy. So it's the judges that are doing that. So it's something that's so obviously too politicized that they can't take that decision and hand it back to, to politicians. <coughs> now, I don't know. I mean, this debate, I think, is still quite early about what political architect architecture is needed as a superstructure <coughs> for uh, a Eurozone solution. But certainly, in what I have read, the legitimacy of the European Union is perceived to be part of the problem. So I think there will be some attempts to address that. How you address it, I don't know. I mean, I've been teaching the legitimacy and democracy of the European Union long enough in all sorts of solutions about institutional reforms, but constantly turnout at European elections seems to go down. The creation of a European demos has been challenged by the Eurozone crisis because everybody's thinking domestically. They're no longer thinking in a, a European white. So the demos is, is less present than ever. So I don't know quite what these, I'd be interested to see what these proposals are going to be that offer more participation that address the le legitimacy problem. Um, think tanks in Berlin and the political parties, I hope, are working on the case right now, but I don't uh, see what, the, the, what there is to offer on that front, I have to say. I'm a bit of a pessimist on that front, but I come from a Eurosceptic state, even if not a Eurosceptic myself. So. Yeah, well, of course. <laughs> I'm in good company.
All right, thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, of course, we are happy to, to have you get away from your desk, and we are extremely grateful for you, to you for, for sharing your views about the German role in the European Union with us. So, again, please join me in. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.